So he's still missing that Declan Curry. Where is he? But luckily, we've got Alice Baxter here with us with this week's Your Money. Alice, hello. And what have you got for us? Well, don't worry, Declan's back next week for you, Maxine. <laughs> uh, well, if you've got your Saturday morning paper in front of you, it's all over the front pages what we're going to be talking about on Your Money. We're talking pensions and annuities. How do you know if you've got the best deal? We'll be letting you know. Well, this is Your Money, your weekly guide to making the most of your cash here every weekend on BBC News Television and available all week on the BBC iPlayer as well. The best and worst annuity rates have been published. Are you getting the most for your money? And how do you choose the right student bank account? We'll have money tips if you're heading off to university. And councils in England and Wales have been accused of relying too much on bailiffs to recover debt. If you receive a visit, do you have to let them in? Very warm welcome to you. I'm Alice Baxter and welcome to Your Money. Now, if you retire and you've been saving in your own pension plan, you can swap your savings for an insurance policy that pays an income for the rest of your life. It's called an annuity. Well, the Association of British Insurers has published tables that compare the annuity rates offered by the giants of the UK insurance industry, which shows that some annuities appear to provide poor value for money. Some of the UK's biggest insurance companies are offering pensions and payouts that are up to 23% lower than the leading rates. Well, with me now is Malcolm McLean from pensions consultancy Barnet Waddington. Malcolm, good to see you this morning. We were just saying earlier, across the Saturday morning papers, annuities and pensions getting a pretty bad press, aren't they? Because this is a minefield. It's a complicated topic. It's incredibly important people get it right. How do they know if they are? It is a complicated area and many people get it wrong. I think 400,000 4, 400, people to have taken out annuities in, in recent years and I suspect many of them have actually got the wrong annuity. So this is an area which really needs bottoming out and you, you really need to take great care to make sure you get this right. Um, as I was just saying, big differences in what providers are offering. How do you know if you've picked the right product for you? What's the checklist you've got to go through? Well, there are three things really you need to think about. One is timing. When do you want to take the annuity? Indeed, do you want to take one at all? Because uh, you can't do anything under normally under age 55, but from 55 onwards, you can delay taking your annuity or you can set up what's called a drawdown plan whereby the pot of money remains with you and you sort of draw the interest off it, as it were. Uh, and leave the question of annuity perhaps for a later date. And are you perhaps even better off waiting till you're in your 70s and 80s perhaps? Well, that's a difficult one because you, you will probably get a better rate because you're older and therefore the insurance company knows they have less, there is less time for them to pay this annuity to you because we don't, none of us live forever, of course, and these things are lifetime products. Uh, but by the same token, it, it's quite risky, is this, because your pot of money may go down because the investments are not performing, and there are other factors as well. You may actually be drawing out too much, and, and, and eventually when you do go for an annuity, you might get less. And, of course, annuity rates for the last 20 years have been on the, a downward slide because people are living longer, and that is reflected in to some extent in some of the rates that are payable. So the timing's important, the type of annuity is also important. The type it? of annuity, yes, there are different types of annuity and this is where I think many people really do get confused because you can get an annuity which pays an ele a level amount for the rest of your life, you can get one that covers you for inflation, you can get one with a spouse's benefit um, in the event of your death, so there are all these possibilities. Of course, the more bells and whistles, as it were, that you have on this, the lower the amount is. And many people, wrongly, I think, go for the level annuity, which is not going to go up. And in the case of a married couple, for example, that means if the man's taking a level annuity, he's not covering in the event of his death for his wife. So, again, that's an important area of choice. So the timing's important, the type of annuity, and of course getting the best provider as well, and seeking advice, presumably. Yeah, the best provider, the, the, the um, tables that the Association of British Insurers uh, came out were quite revealing in the sense that they showed a big disparity between the worst and the best, some like 30% difference. And on an average annuity, that could make as much as £2,000 a year difference. And bear in mind, we're not talking about one year here. If you've got a life expectation of 30 years, 
then you're talking about £60,000. Who can afford to miss that? A once and for all decision, you've got to get it right. I advise everybody to get financial advice in this situation. Sound advice indeed. Malcolm, many thanks for coming in this morning. Malcolm McLean there. Now, thousands of new students will be entering university for the very first time next month. And for some, dealing with their finances on their own can be a daunting prospect. So that's why choosing the right bank account could be vital to ensure that you're financially fit so that you can focus on getting that top-class degree. Ramzan Kamali has been down to the University of Brighton to see how one fresher's finances are shaping up. So the euphoria after last week's A-level results may have subsided now to be replaced by feelings of excitement as many head off to university for the very first time. But the cold reality of managing your finances is just one huge problem facing freshers as they enter the brand new world of student life. Stephanie Fitzgibbon is off to the University of Brighton to study physical education. As I said, this is the chess press. She's been trying to get her finances in order. But weighing up which bank account to choose wasn't as straightforward as she would have liked. Most of them, the first thing they tell you are the gimmicks. And as a first time student, I got quite distracted by it all. Um, and I, I started to look at the gimmicks rather than what they had to offer as a bank. Um, so that was a bit complicated for me because I got confused as to what I was meant to be looking for in the bank. And Stephanie's not alone. Almost half a million new undergraduates will be learning the financial ropes for the very first time. But there is help out there and some simple tips to follow too. Check your entitlement first. Shop around for the right bank account that, that suits you. Don't rush out and buy everything on your book list. Universities have excellent free resources. Um, look to see what discounts you can get when you get an NUS extra card. Don't be afraid to ask if they do any reductions for students in shops and other services. But when it comes to choosing the right bank account, the variety of options available can be confusing. Many offer interest-free overdrafts. Some can be as much as £3,000. And then there are the non-financial incentives, like a free young person's rail card, especially useful if you're travelling far from home to study. And banks may also entice students with free music downloads, and even money off holidays abroad. So how can you make sure you're picking the right account for you? If you are going to need to use an overdraft, then look at the one with the best long-term overdraft. Don't be swayed by the things that you might get, like theatre tickets, which are great when you sign up, but actually then you may be paying more for your bank account long-term than you need to. So avoid the gimmicks, look at the small print, and decide which is the best account for you in the long term. Stephanie decided not to go for the bank account with the biggest overdraft, but one which will get gradually larger the longer she stays at university. She's determined to remain financially disciplined and to make sure she's never too hard pressed when it comes to money. Ramzan Karamali, BBC News. Now, seven million people could be in line for hundreds of pounds in compensation for being missold credit card and identity theft protection. Thirteen banks and credit card firms have agreed to provide up to £1.3 billion towards a new compensation scheme. It will reimburse customers missold the products by the insurer CPP. The Financial Conduct Authority, or the FSA, said that customers had been given misleading and unclear information about the policies. Customers could expect to receive letters from next week explaining how to claim their compensation. Six high street furniture and carpet retailers have been accused of misleading their customers with fake prices. The Office of Fair Trading said the stores had all advertised price cuts which were not genuine. In particular, they advertised reductions from previously higher prices which tricked customers into thinking they were getting a bargain. Well, carpet right and the SCS chain are among the six being investigated. And men receive bonuses more than twice as large as those given to female colleagues in identical jobs. It means that men earn over £140,000 more than women over the course of a working lifetime. The figures from the Chartered Management Institute reveal that men in management roles earned average bonuses of £6,442 last year, compared with £3,029 for women. 
And eight months after the government launched its flagship Green Deal scheme, only 132 people have signed up to it. Under the scheme, householders can borrow money to install double glazing insulation and more efficient boilers. The savings they make on their energy bills should outweigh the cost of repayments. If a house or flat is subsequently sold, the loan transfers to the new owner. Well, in March, the Minister for Energy and Climate Change, Greg Barker, said he expected 10,000 people to be signed up by the end of 2013. Now, local councils are using bailiffs more and more to collect debts such as tax arrears and parking tickets. In fact, they've been used almost two million times last year. That's according to figures obtained by the Money Advice Trust. So if you owe money and they come knocking at your door, what are your rights? Well, let's talk now to Mike Dixon, the Assistant Chief Executive at the Citizens Advice. He's in our uh, Cambridge studio for us. Mike, good to talk to you this morning. I've just been saying that uh, council's using bailiffs more and more. But for what sort of debts are we talking about here? Even the odd parking fine? Well, this is for parking fines, it's for council tax arrears, it's for pretty much anything. We're finding that lots of people that come to Citizens Advice um, have had an issue with bailiffs recently. So it's in no one's best interest for this to be happening. And it's very sad that councils seem to, in some cases, be moving towards using them much too quickly. Let's say you are unlucky enough to have a bailiff come knocking at your door. Mm. What are your rights? Do you have to let them in? Will you be uh, arrested if you don't? No, you absolutely won't. Um, the sad thing here is the legislation around bailiffs is actually extremely complicated. So different bailiffs have different rights depending on what the debt is. The, the basic rule of thumb, though, is you don't have to let them in. You can be, just be really polite when they come. Um, they are people too. Um, and tell them that you will negotiate with the person to whom you owe money. Um, that's what people want out of this situation. The council or the creditor wants their money back, and if you're prepared to enter into a decent repayment plan with them, you can always negotiate a solution rather than having bailiffs come back and back. If that's something you're having problem doing, then uh, Citizens Advice is here to offer free advice on debt and other issues, and we can help you negotiate with your creditors to get you out of that situation. And if you dispute the debt that they're chasing, what can you do about it? Who should you go and talk to? Well, citizens' advice is always a good port of call. Um, one of the problems we're really seeing with bailiffs um, is this is a very, very unregulated industry, and lots of bailiffs are putting on kind of spurious charges, charging a, a lot of money for call-outs, for administration, and those sorts of things, which take a, what can start off as quite a small debt into something that is much, much harder to repay. And we want the government to take much stronger action against the bailiff industry to stamp out that kind of rogue behaviour. OK, Mike, thanks for talking us through this issue this morning. Mike Dixon there from Citizens Advice. Thank you. Well, that's all from your money uh, for this week. As I was saying, Declan's back in the helm next Saturday. Don't forget the Your Money page is on the BBC's business website. It's bbc.co.uk forward slash business. Click on the words Your Money. Uh, they're near the top of the page. You can also get updates by following our feed on Twitter. We're at BBC Your Money. And we're back next week, of course. Bye for now. Thank you.